a very very good evening to all the foreign medical graduates uh, this is dr vineet gupta your surgery faculty uh, this is uh, a small session where i would just try to see the analysis that uh, how the different uh, questions have been asked in the recent examination whether it is foreign medical graduate or the neat pg or the ini ct exams and uh, herein i have just compiled some 25 hot topics or the hot areas from where the questions can be picked in the uh, coming examinations so one thing which is absolutely clear that this is just a small effort i am not at all aware about what is going to be asked and what is not going to be asked but if we start in a sequence like trauma, vascular, endocrine, and then pediatric surgery, adult surgery, and the onco surgery, in trauma section, we know that Glasgow Coma Scale is something which is going to be very, very important. And my dear doctors, there would be a clinical case situation should be there, uh, wherein you will be getting uh, the assessment of the eye, verbal, and the motor responses. For example, in this particular question, is focusing on mechanical ventilation. That means there is a tube which is going through the vocal cords the patient will not be able to make any sound so we are not going to we are not will not be able to assess the verbal score in this patient however the eyes opening on voice command and uh, mobility is uh, complete so i4 is spontaneous i3 to voice or to sound i2 to pressure pain i1 no response Verbal 5 is oriented, verbal 4 is confused, verbal 3 inappropriate words, verbal 2 incomprehensible sounds, verbal 1 no sound at all. And motor 6 obeys, 5 localized, 4 normal flexion or withdraws, 3 abnormal flexion, 2 abnormal extension and 1 no response. So the total maximum is 15, total minimum is 3. Mild is 13 to 15, moderate 9 to 12 and severe is 8 or less than 8. In a comatose patient, it should be 8 less than 8. In a dead patient, it should be 3. It can never be 0. Motor score is something which is uh, most valuable for prognosis. So, there may be a clinical situation like this. Now, another hot topic in trauma is related to extradural hematomas, the lucid interval wherein either the examiner may give you a clinical situation related to a lucid interval and then he may ask you something related to lucid interval like which of the following vessels is getting involved. So we all know that an extradural hematoma it is the middle meningeal artery which is getting involved. And middle meningeal artery is a branch of maxillary artery. Or there can be an image based question like we know that hyperdense convex is seen in extradural. We know that hyperdense concave is seen in subdural hematomas. This is a depressed skull fracture story and this is something which is a pneumothorax on this particular side. So these type of questions may be asked in relation to lucid interval or extradural hematoma or maybe any subdural hematomas. The first image based question ever asked in the history of FMG examination in 2015 was this image of extradural hematoma and since then it has been repeated quite often in our exam. So all my dear doctors, all those who are going to appear for 12 December, please do not miss out on these images. Now, apart from this, one another important area is regarding chest trauma the radiology integration with surgery wherein you might be getting an image of maybe pneumothorax or a hemothorax or a tension pneumothorax type of situation or they may be giving you a clinical scenario related to this uh, tension pneumothorax for example these are two different type of scenarios what are framed here the two images what you're seeing my dear doctors please be careful here now in these two images what you can make out is that uh, this side the entire story is occupied by the air and if you carefully look at this particular shadow, the vertebra is central, but the soft tissue shadow, the tracheal shadow has been shifted towards the opposite side. So this should be a case of tension pneumothorax. Another image, something like this, huge amount of air on this side. Here in what you can see, the soft tissue shadow has moved towards the opposite side. So these can be the hot image based questions, or there may be a question related to flail chest, or there may be a question where you will be finding the haziness at the bottom which should be suggestive of hemothorax. So my dear doctors, please be careful about these images of pneumothorax, hemothorax and tension pneumothorax. They may be giving you a clinical scenario related to these stuff. Now another hot area is the 
table which we have made in the notes regarding how you have to manage the blunt trauma abdomen patients they might be giving you a clinical situation whether the patient is hemodynamically stable or patient is hemodynamically unstable so my dear doctors please be careful if the patient is hemodynamically stable then you just admit the patient under observation and then you can go with the fast but the best information you'll be getting on CECT majority of the time treatment for these stable patients would be conservative non-operative but if the examiner gives you any unstable type of situation then first of all you have to save the life my dear doctors you are going to be the most noble people of this society so the first aim of a doctor is to save the life in an emergency please be careful about this any clinical scenario of emergency in all the subjects you have to just save the life first and when you'll be able to save the life then you can go with the definitive treatment so in an unstable patient, you start the basic resuscitation with IV crystalloids. Colloids are never given initially in a hypovolemic shock situation. Then, if needed, you can pump in blood, blood products. And while you are resuscitating this patient, the ABC is going on in the emergency. If you have the facility of FAST, please do a FAST quickly to see where is the exact injury. And then you have to take the patient for a laparotomy in blunt trauma abdomen if the patient is unstable, wherein you open the abdomen by a midline incision. So this table is going to be important from where you might be getting a question on 12th of December. Now, there is something which we have seen in the last three exams that the focus of the examiner is more towards the retroperitoneal pathologies. And commonly what we have seen, they might give you a story of central upper abdominal pain radiating to the back, uh, which is aggravated in supine position, relieved on bending forwards, or there may be a clinical situation related to rupture abdominal aortic aneurysm. The first scenario was related to pancreatitis. The second scenario would be related to rupture aneurysm. So in this particular question, my dear friends, the examiner has specified 72 years, that means elderly patient. He is presenting in a state of shock, no pulse, no BP recordable, cool clammy peripheries, a resuscitation is being done and there is a suspicion of huge amount of blood in the retroperitoneum with very high chance of mortality. So you have to find out a retroperitoneal pathology which is related to bleeding. Pseudocyst will not be related to bleeding, it will be related to leakage of fluid and enzymes. Hepatic hemangioma will cause intraperitoneal bleed and not the retroperitoneal. Splenic artery aneurysms will not be leading to such a huge amount of shock status. Rupture abdominal aortic aneurysm would be a better answer in these particular situations. Right, my dear doctor, so be careful in this area. Now, apart from this, another hot topic, mark my words beta, that 12th of December, there would be a question which would be relating to urethral injury maybe a posterior urethral membranous urethral injury or the anterior urethral injury that is the perineal bulbar urethral injury for example generally what we have seen the examiners are asking that patient has come to you with a suspected urethral trauma and the patient is in retention of urine what will be the management generally the management in these cases is the suprapubic cystostomy they may even ask you what is the site of collection of urine that would be a vertical integration with the anatomy in this if they ask you about the posterior urethral injury that is the membranous urethra the urine will be getting collected in the true pelvis but if they ask you about an anterior urethral injury that is a perineal bulbar urethral injury the urine will be getting collected in the superficial inguinal superficial perineal pouch the scrotum the penis and deep to the scarpa's fascia between the scarpa's and the external oblique epineurosis in the lower abdomen so they may ask you about the site of collection of urine right my dear doctors again important area you cannot miss out before 12th of december the urethral trauma stories Another situation. Now, in the recent exams, we have seen that there are questions relating to the site of traffic jam in the peripheral arteries. For example, the lower limbs are something which are focused more on. They will give you a clinical situation. Herein, there are three types of questions, my dear doctors, wherein the examiner may give you the symptoms and the palpation of the pulses. 
For example, the examiner may tell you that patient is presenting with pain in both the uh, gluteal region or the buttocks uh, and the uh, thigh area plus there would be pain in both the calf, both the leg areas and the foot areas as well. And on clinical examination, no pulses are palpable in both the lower limbs. So this should be a case of aortoiliac obstruction. But if the examiner takes you towards one side lower limb, he may give you that patient presented with pain in the thighs and the calf leg area. Uh, on examination, the femoral was palpable, but the popliteal and distal pulses were absent. So the site of traffic jam in this patient would be the femoropopliteal area, that is the femoral arterial obstruction. Okay. So these type of situations are also very common in the current pattern of examination. They may even ask you that what should be the treatment, best treatment offered in these type of situations. So best treatment, my dear doctors, for supraingual obstruction, that is the aortoiliac would be a decron graft. For inguinal level, the iliac level obstruction, it would be angioplasty. And for infrainguinal, that is the femoropopliteal bypass, it would be the great cephanous vein bypass graft. So please be ready for these type of questions. There might be a clinical situation here. There are three different type of clinical situations mentioned related to this particular concept. Now, if we come into the venous system, we can get a question on varicose veins. There may be a question related to classification of these veins. Like currently, we are seeing questions related to seep classification, which is a clinical, etiological, anatomical and pathogenesis classification. Uh, and according to the seep classification, if we take a look at the seep story, C0 is no visible or palpable signs of venous disease. C1 is telling ectasia or reticular veins. C2 is varicose veins where C2A is asymptomatic. C2B is symptomatic. C2R is recurrent varicose veins. C3 is edema. C4 is skin changes where C4A is pigmentation or eczema. C4B is lipodermatosclerosis or atrophy blanche. And C4C is corona flebectasias. C5 is a healed venous ulcer, C6 is an active venous ulcer and C6R is a recurrent active venous ulcer. They may give you an image of these reticular veins, something like this. As you can see, these are the reticular veins, so they belong to C1 category. However, they may give you an image something like this, where there is just abnormal dilatation toxicity of the veins. Patient is asymptomatic, so this would be a C2A type of story. So be careful. A hot topic which has been seen recently in 2021 is the C classification for varicose veins. Also, my dear doctors, for varicose veins, you might get an image-based question of maybe lipodermatosclerosis or a venous ulcer. So don't miss out on these images. And also, I would like to tell you that how do we solve the image-based questions? We see the image, we look at the options. So here you look at the image, this is lipodermatosclerosis. You look at the option, there is a lipodermatosclerosis. But my dear doctors, please do not forget to read the last line of the question. The question here is, which is not a complication associated with the above disease etiology. That means the examiner is not asking what is this. The examiner is asking which is not a complication associated with this disease etiology, like varicose veins. So veins aneurysm cannot occur. So just be careful. Please do read the last line of the question first. Also, we tell you, my dear doctors, that whenever lengthy questions are there, we try to read the last line of the question first, look at the options and then go and read the stem of the question. That is the best way of getting the correct answer. So this is another hot area what I personally feel. Another thing, my dear doctors, there would be a question related to deep vein thrombosis, like home and sign has been asked recently uh, quite a lot of times. So you know that deep vein thrombosis most often is seen in the calf, the soleal vein, and most often it is related to prolonged immobilization, wherein Homans and Moses sign are positive. Hammond sign is seen in Bohr-Harvey syndrome, not the deep vein thrombosis. Homans sign is seen in deep vein thrombosis. Right, my dear doctors. Another thing, you can get a few images, uh, image-related questions on lymphedema because this lymphedema can easily be identifiable by looking at the image. So they may give you a clinical scenario like uh, a lady who has undergone modified radical mastectomy for a lymph node positive breast cancer and she has developed this type of complication. 
So this is most likely because of removal of the axillary lymph nodes in modified radical mastectomy. So this area is going to be a crucial area where you have to identify the different different images here. Now there might be one question either from the breast abscess story or maybe from the fibroadenomas. For breast abscess, they may ask you what is the culprit of this breast abscess. We all know, my dear doctors, that the culprit here is the staph aureus. But if you look at the vertical integration here, the integration between microbiology and surgery, like uh, staph aureus, you have to identify from these options. Chinese letter pattern, Corini bacterium, grape cluster, soil paint, staph aureus. Robertson Cook Meat Media Clostridia, Darting Motility Vibrio. So that is how you can identify the correct answer here, right? So they, there might be few questions like this. And fibroadenoma, my dear doctors, uh, the fibroadenoma, they may give you what is the indication or what is not the indication of removing a fibroadenoma. We all know there is a popcorn-like calcification in fibroadenoma. So you can uh, focus on this. And my dear doctors, this particular question, oh my God, what has happened to this in the last three examinations? No exam has gone without being asking the metabolic abnormality in gastric outlet obstructions. We know that the clinical scenario may be anything, but the examiner is focusing on the pyloric obstruction. My dear doctors, it can be congenital or infantile hypertrophic pyloric stenosis. It can be peptic ulcer disease. It can be a gastric cancer. Any clinical scenario would be given. The examiner is just trying to extract that if there is a traffic jam at the pylorus and the patient is having non-bilious vomiting, what can be the different metabolic abnormalities? Please do not miss out on this very hot MCQ in the last one, one and a half years. Right, beta? You know that acid is lost, so there will be metabolic alkalosis. Chloride is lost, there will be hypochloremia. And since the patient is vomiting, he would be dehydrated. ADH aldosterone would be stimulated. They would be reabsorbing sodium from the kidney tubules and would be excreting potassium and H ions in urine. So potassium in urine, caliuresis, hypokalemia, H ion in urine, paradoxical aciduria. So my dear doctors, please be careful about this hypochloremia, hypokalemia, metabolic alkalosis. Very important before you go for 12th of December. Another hot area, my dear friends, image-based question related to into susception. They may simply give you this image, my dear doctors, and they may ask you, what is this type of into susception? Herein, you can see a tubular appendix like this. So this should be a ileocolic into susception. Or recently, they have been focusing on this claw sign, which we see in into susception. Into susception is something which is full of signs, so a very hot area for the MCQs, my dear doctors. There is a sausage lump in the right hypochondrium. Empty right eyelid fossa is the sign of dance, red current jelly stools, examiner finger stained with blood, ultrasound donut sign, barium enema, claw sign and coil spring sign. Best is CECT, treatment is air enema reduction. Or maybe saline barium can be used, operative reduction if this uh, hydrostatic reduction fails where we gently push and not pull in into susception. So this is an important area. Now, my dear friends, another area which is important is uh, something related to urethrocele, this cobra head or adder head, the two laddus in the pelvis. What you can see here, this is again a hot question which has been repeated quite often. This is a cobra head, adder head appearance. My dear friends, there is a cystoscopy image for this, wherein you can see a bulge inside the bladder. So this is cobra head, adder head appearance. This may be asked or there may be a question related to duplication of renal pelvis or duplication of ureter. Duplication of renal pelvis, we find a drooping lily sign. What lily sign is seen in hydrated cyst? And uh, duplication of ureter, the ectopic ureter most often is opening in the apex of trigon. As you can see in this picture, it is opening in the apex of trigon, though it can open in the prostatic urethra or in the seminal vesicle area. Right, my dear doctors, so this area is also somewhat uh, where the questions are being picked recently. Another thing, my dear doctors, recently they are focusing on the concept what is undescended testis and what is ectopic testis. So undescended beta, if the testis are arrested anywhere in the normal path of descent, whether it is the top of the scrotum or the superficial inguinal ring or the inguinal canal or the deep inguinal ring or beneath the deep inguinal ring in the peritoneal cavity, this is undescended. 
but if the testes deviate from the normal path of descent and come to lie somewhere else, maybe either at the root of penis or in the perineum, superficial inguinal pouch, femoral canal, this is ectopic testis. So they are just trying to extract the concept here, beta. I would like to say this in Hindi. Agar testis apne normal raste mein kahi pe atak jati hai, to undescended bhatak jati hai, to ectopic testis bolte hai. You have to just remember this concept. Common site of undescended testis is inguinal canal and ectopic testis, it is a superficial inguinal pouch. The treatment for undescended testis is uh, orchidopexy done at six months of age. Another question, my dear doctors, if we come to the adult surgical problems, binge drinking is something which they have been asking like anything. And this is something which is commonly associated with uh, two clinical situations, my dear doctors. One is a Mallory B. Steer, another is a Bohr Harvey syndrome. Binge drinking, two clinical situations which is commonly uh, there in the questions. Now, Bohr Harvey syndrome or spontaneous esophageal rupture or barotrauma, my dear doctors, this is an esophageal rupture, lower esophageal rupture, which involve all the layers of the esophagus, leading to severe mediastinitis, left sided chest pain radiating here, where we can find subcutaneous emphysema, Hammond's crunch, mediastinal crunch. But Mallory V tear, this is just a longitudinal tear, mucosal tear in the gastric mucosa just beneath the gastroesophageal junction. Both are commonly seen in alcoholics when the stomach is full and there is forceful vomiting. Okay, Mallory Vs, there won't be any perforation beta, there won't be any left-sided chest pain, there won't be any pneumomediastinum story. So please watch on this. Another commonly asked question again beta, this is again an integration of anatomy, ENT and surgery here. The Killian's dehiscence is uh, what they have been asking in some or the other way. Uh, the pharyngeal pouch or the Zenkus diverticula, what we are seeing here, this uh, is out pouching of the posterior pharyngeal wall posteriorly through the Killian's dehiscence between the fibers of thyropharyngeus and cricopharyngeus of inferior constrictor muscle. Commonly seen in elderly, it is a false diverticula. More than 4 centimeters of these diverticula require dolmen's operation. So, this Zenkus can be an important question. Another important question, Vita, once again, I would like to specify that I don't know why, but your examiners are liking this uh, question like anything, the image-based question of Ecclesia Cardia. Now, herein, you have to focus on the sharp pencil tip or the bird beak appearance, okay? This image again has been repeated number of times. This is a corkscrew esophagus diffuse esophageal spasm, right? The challenge is how to differentiate between ecclesia and cancer esophagus. Let us just try to make an attempt here. Here, beta, if you focus, it is a sharp tapering from both the sides, giving a classical bird beak or pencil tip. Here also there is a sharp tapering from both the sides giving a classical pencil tip or a bird beak appearance. But if we talk about malignancy beta, it is not a sharp tapering like a bird beak. Can you see this particular area? This is not like a bird beak beta. So this is where we will go with the cancer esophagus story. But commonly what they have been asking is about the ecclesia cardias. Right. So do not miss out on this. Apart from this, again, the two x-rays, the pneumoperitoneum x-ray and the intestinal obstruction x-ray, there would be a long uh, two-kilometer clinical situation and there would be a x-ray. All these x-rays, they are showing gas under diaphragm, my dear doctors. If you see, this is the diaphragm here and there is huge amount of air collected beneath the diaphragm. This is pneumoperitoneum suggestive of hollow viscous perforation in the abdomen. Another image what you are seeing, this is a, a gas in the diaphragm image and there was a clinical situation in the recently conducted INICET exam where they gave this type of image with a clinical situation and they asked what is this and the answer there was uh, hollow viscous perforation, right beta? So these are few x-rays of gas in the diaphragm, be careful about these x-rays and do not uh, leave these x-rays before your exam. Another type of question what we are expecting is from the different clinical situations related to gallbladder pathologies. 
they may be asking something related to charcoal stride seen in cholangitis, pain fever, jaundice, maybe Raynaud's pentard, pain fever, jaundice, hypotension, mental confusion, signs of septicemia, again in cholangitis. Or they may be asking something like Mirizi syndrome, which is compression of the common hepatic duct by a large gallbladder stone. Or they may be asking something related to gallstone ileus, where if there is a fistula of gallbladder with the duodenum, the stone slips into the duodenum and cause traffic jam at the terminal ileum, leading to intestinal obstruction. So there might be a clinical situation something like this. Important here is a regular stride, which is multiple air fluid levels. Uh, stone in the intestine and air inside the gallbladder. My dear doctors, multiple air fluid levels is just a sign of intestinal obstruction. But air in the gallbladder is a sign of any abnormal connection between the gallbladder and the intestines, right? And uh, there is a rare possibility of uh, being asked this type of image. This is a ERCP image which is showing multiple filling defects. Please do not miss out on this. Another situation, my dear doctors, they may be giving you a clinical situation. Once again, severe central upper abdominal pain radiating to the back, aggravated in supine, relieved on bending forwards. CT scan showing fluid collections. They might give you a CT scan image of pseudocyst of the pancreas. And you know that if it is pancreatitis, then it is the amylase and the lipase which are going to be raised most often. These are the images of intestinal obstruction. Be careful. You can see the multiple air fluid levels. I would just like to give you that in the exam you might be getting either a straight single liner question, image based question or you might be getting a clinical scenario of intestinal obstruction. Just to remind you single bubble, pyloric obstruction, double bubble, duodenal atresias or annular pancreas, triple bubble, jejunal obstruction, multiple air fluid levels in the central part of the abdomen, small intestinal obstruction, multiple air bubbles or multiple air fluid levels in the peripheral part of abdomen that is a large intestinal obstruction. So please do not miss out on this. And uh, they keep on focusing on these uh, valvular coniventis uh, at times, which is suggestive of jejunal obstruction. Right, my dear friends. So I hope uh, you would be nicely prepared with these type of questions. Another hot area what we are seeing in the recent exam is something related to image-based question of renal tuberculosis, maybe a putty kidney or a cement kidney, maybe a thimble bladder type of story would be there. So please, uh, please uh, do not miss out on this and try to differentiate this with a staghorn stone. Staghorn stone would be occupying the entire pelvic elytial system in the shape of the pelvic elytial system. Also a hot image based question which has been asked in the recent exam is an image of bladder calculus, vesicle calculus. Right. Another story from appendix, we are expecting either something related to mental scoring, uh, maybe the entire mental scoring, maybe exclusion type of question or maybe a question that two points are given to tenderness and leukocytosis, Alvarado score, this is done for acute appendicitis or there may be a question related to either appendicular abscess where we are doing extra peritoneal drainage or appendicular mass, a clinical story would be cooked there where Oshner Sharon regime, the conservative treatment is offered. So this is again a hot area. Also do not forget to remember the incisions used for appendicectomy. Regarding hernias, they may be asking you about the pathogenesis or the basic difference between indirect direct hernias. Indirect hernias beta, they are lateral hernias, lateral to inferior epigastric vessels through the deep inguinal ring. Direct hernias are medial to inferior epigastric vessels through the Heselbeck's triangle. Treatment for both these hernias is a tension-free polypropylene mesh hernioplasty, which is a Lichenstein operation, okay? They may ask you the Nihes classification, 1, 2, indirect, 3, A, direct, 3, B, both, 3, C, femoral, 4, recurrent. So there may be a question from the hernias here or they may give you a clinical question of a strangulated hernia where the patient has presented an emergency, how you are going to manage this situation, okay? Apart from this, Hopefully, you will be getting a question related to testicular torsion. Again, a clinical story would be cooked here or it can be a direct image based question. You know in testicular torsion, the most common cause is bell clapper deformity, testis hanging like a clapper in the bell. And uh, most often 10 to 25 years of age, redness, swelling of the scrotum, pain, prince sign, 
differentiated from epididyme orchitis clinically where elevation of the scrotum will rel relieve pain in epididyme orchitis positive friend sign in epididyme orchitis but it will not relieve pain in testicular torsion negative friend sign in testicular torsion when we do the examination we find the test is pulled up the spermatic cord is thickened and the cremistic reflex is absent in case of testicular torsion if the patient comes to us early within six hours, 100% of the testes can be saved by derotation, orchidopexy, and contralateral orchidopexy. But if the patient comes after 24 hours, only 20% of the testes can be saved. And if we cannot save the testes, we have to do an orchidectomy plus contralateral orchidopexy. And these are some image based questions, my dear doctors. Like there may be a question related to rectal prolapse or maybe a question related to hemorrhoids or anorectalapsis where you are making a cruciate incision, maybe a question related to fistula in ano, there may be uh, the type, the intersphincteric is the most common, maybe something related to good salts rule for differentiating anterior and posterior fistula in ano. Anterior fistulas have got a direct track, posterior have got a curved track and they open in midline posteriorly or they may be giving you a clinical scenario of anal fissure how to treat these anal fissures we just want to relax the anal sphincter and make the stool soft wherein we are using the stool softness high fiber diet sitz bath diltiazem and nitroglycerin ointments we cannot do a proctoscopy in these anal fissures it is an extremely painful condition and my dear doctors don't forget to look at this pyloneal sinus 22 to 29 years of age four times more common in males those who have got a hairy gluteal skin have got a risk of this pyloneal sinus right if we take a look at the onco surgery, there are two situations, my dear doctors, which I would like to emphasize. One is the treatment for breast cancer, the stage wise treatment for breast cancer, and then the treatment for prostate cancer. Please do not leave these two areas stage wise treatment of breast cancer, stage wise treatment of prostate cancer. And here, the catch what they can give in prostate cancer. If the age is more than 70 years, the life expectancy is less than 10 years. So even if the cancer is confined within the prostate, we are not going to do a radical prostatectomy or external beam radiotherapy or brachytherapy with uh, iodine or palladium. In these situations, active surveillance is preferred. But the, if the age of the patient is less than 70, life expectancy more than 10 years, then yes, if the cancer is confined within the prostate, you can go ahead with radical prostatectomy or external beam radiotherapy to destroy this prostate. If the cancer of prostate has spread beyond the prostate, my dear doctors, the only treatment option is hormonal therapy, androgen ablation. And in this, you can use the various LHRH stories like the gosarilin, busarilin, you can use the enzalutamides, you can use the abiratiron type of things. Surgical castration by bilateral total subcapsular orchidectomy is considered inferior to the medical castration therapies. Breast cancer story, they will be giving you a clinical situation like here it is a T1N0, M0. You should be knowing that what all treatments we are doing for early breast cancer, locally advanced breast cancer and advanced gastric cancer. Early breast cancer is T1, T2, N0, N1. Locally advanced is uh, T3, T4, N2, N3 and metastatic is NET, NEN but M1. Early breast cancers can be treated either by a breast conservative surgery with mandatory adjuvant radiotherapy plus minus chemo, hormonal or targeted therapy with trastuzumab. Or Early breast cancers can be managed by simple mastectomy, maybe associated with followed by uh, chemotherapy, hormonal therapy, targeted therapy. While the locally advanced breast cancers, generally we give neoadjuvant chemotherapy before surgery, try to downstage the tumor, then we do a surgery whether it is a simple mastectomy or a modified radical mastectomy, generally it's a modified radical mastectomy followed by completion chemotherapy if needed and depending on the situation, radiotherapy, hormonal therapy or targeted therapy, if R2 new is positive, then we are giving trastuzumab. If receptors, estrogen, progesterone receptors are positive, premenopausal females, we are giving tamoxifen 20 milligram once a day, 5 to 10 years. And if it is a postmenopausal female, we are giving anastrozoles. For a metastatic breast cancer, my dear doctors, the treatment would be palliative. Just a simple mastectomy would be sufficient. There may be a question, again, an integration of pathology with surgery, where they may be asking you about the different tumor markers. So I'm 
pretty sure, very confident that you have already done these tumor markers nicely. Like we know that CA125 is something we talk in ovarian cancers, CA99 we talk in pancreatic cancers, gallbladder cancers, alpha fetoprotein, the hepatocellular carcinomas and uh, the testicular yolk sac tumors, the HCG in the choriocarcinomas, right? So out of the following what we are seeing here, CA99 for pancreatic cancer holds true, others are false. Apart from this, there may be an image based question, either this is a familial adenomatous polyposis or they can ask you something related to Peutz Jagger syndrome. So don't miss out on these images as well. Another hot area is the sister Mary Joseph nodule, that is a periumbilical tumor deposits, direct peritoneal spread, transcellomic spread seen in ovarian malignancies, gastric malignancies. They may give you a situation of bony metastasis like here. This is a bony metastasis in the lumbar vertebra. The common cancers metastasizing to bone are prostate cancer in males, breast cancer in females. Apart from this, for both males and females, the kidney cancer, the lung cancer and the thyroid cancers. They may give you a image something like this. So a hypodense shadow, generally prostate breast cancers, they spread most often to the bones, lumbar vertebra, through Beckson's vertebral plexus of veins. Bony metastasis in prostate cancer are osteoblastic, while in other cancers, they are osteoclastic. Why osteoblastic in prostate? Because of androgens. And this is again a pathology question. I'm so sorry of stealing this question from pathology here. You know this is an orphan NEI nuclei and this is a samoma body. Samoma body is something which is commonly seen in papillary renal cell carcinoma, papillary thyroid cancer, serous adenoma of ovary, pituitary adenoma, salivary adenoma, meningiomas. There was a clinical situation last time of a meningioma with samoma bodies. And my dear doctors, with uh, these words, just the hot 25 stories I've tried to share with you. And I know that you all are really working very, very hard. Just keep yourself focused. Just, just keep on believing in yourself. You all know that you have to just hang in there for the next 26 days. The sacrifices which you have made in the last six years, don't let them go in vain. Your parents are also waiting for the reward of your sacrifices and their sacrifices. We all want to see those happy tears in the parents' eyes. And believe me, my dear doctors, just keep yourself pumped up. Just keep that fire in your belly and you are definitely going to do it. Nobody on this earth can stop you. Take my words, stay focused and aag laga do pani mein. Dikha do dunia ko apni taakat aur kar lo dunia apni mutthi mein. Thank you very much. Wish you all the very best from the entire mess team. Thank you. God bless you all.